And uh, we think God's doing great things here and excited about the future. So last week, I had the uh, privilege of being at our Mandarin campus, and uh, we did a little bit of uh, installation work with Jeremiah there, said thank you to Daniel and Melissa for their leadership over the last year. When we took over that campus December of 2021, we started with about 40 to 45 people, and uh, literally, without, uh, without any exaggeration, no adults. And uh, we have been consistently over 100. We have 40 children that are actively participating in Trinity Kids on our Mandarin campus. And so God's done some incredible things there over the last uh, 18 months, and we're excited about the future. Jeremiah, his wife Jenny, will provide great leadership there, and uh, we're looking forward to what God is going to do. Really glad you're here. It kind of feels like we're coming not just to the end of this series this week and next, but also feels a little bit like we're coming to the end of summer, doesn't it? And uh, school is right around the corner. And uh, over the years, we have been highly immersed into school calendar issues because of our own schools, Trinity Christian Academy and uh, Trinity Baptist College. So how many of you are engaged in school? In other words, you either are a teacher or you're a student or you're a parent of kids that are gonna start school in the next uh, couple of weeks, just raise your hand, okay? And we are praying for you, right? Um, summer is over, uh, the fun has ended, right? Misery sets in, life is over, no joy forevermore, right? School is back in session. And so uh, we'll, we'll just look forward to a great fall uh, together. Ephesians chapter 3, we're finishing up this series. Really excited about uh, this sermon today. Uh, just, I'm in a season of life where I'm really enjoying studying and uh, loving what we are teaching and preaching on today. Very, what I think is a very an incredibly interesting passage of scripture and incredibly practical. You just have to kind of work through some of the, what I would call the complex concepts and um, and content to get to uh, life-changing, simple truth. Ephesians 3, verse number 1, the mystery of the gospel. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Now, that starts about as practical as you can. Paul says, I'm in jail because of you. That's what he's saying, okay? Now, he's going to interrupt his thought, which is going to pick up in verse 12, by giving us some background to process why that's not a problem to him, while it's not devastating to him, while it's not uh, debilitating in his life for him to be in jail. He says, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, in other words, on your behalf, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, circle that word mystery, as I have written afore in a few words, where, whereby when ye read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. There's our expression again, which in the other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So, so you cannot know this unless God, through his Spirit, reveals it to you. And if you do know it, then you ought to thank God that the Spirit's revealed it to you, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. In other words, we should be fellowshipping together in the body, in the church, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So we have this, this idea, this mystery of the gospel, the mystery of Jesus, the mystery of Christ, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. God's power in the gospel is working on our behalf. Unto me, who am least or less than the least of all saints, is this grace given? <laughs> Just think about this for a moment. Paul says, if you were to make a line of all the good people in the world, I would be at the tail end of the line. I'm at the back of the bus, right? I just barely made it into the line by the, by the skin of my teeth, right? And, and even though I'm the least of all the saints, I've been given the grace of God. God's grace is given to me. And by the way, if it's given to me and I'm the least, then it's been also given 
to you that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent, really with the intent or for the purpose that now under the principalities and powers, the invisible powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now he comes, verse 12, he comes back to this, hey, I'm in jail on your behalf and in Jesus, in him, we have boldness and access with confidence, really the freedom to stand in the presence of God by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire, he says, I long for you not to faint, not to lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is for your glory. A bedrock in our study in Ephesians, the first three chapters, is simply this. Doctrine is the catalyst to duty. Your beliefs determine your behavior. In other words, what you believe is going to impact how you view all of life, how you respond to everything that happens to you. And if you have a faulty belief system, you're gonna have a faulty response to what happens in your life. If you have a gospel-centered view about life, you're gonna be equipped to handle all of the hardships of life. This passage, while it's, it's filled with theological terminology and, and a rich and complex vocabulary, it's actually quite simple. It addresses a problem and it answers some important questions. The problem that this passage addresses is, is simply this. Paul is using his circumstances, being imprisoned because of his faith, his suffering that is, to show you that you do not have to have your, sh- your faith shaken when things fall apart, when bad things happen in your life. He's literally saying you do not have to lose heart. You do not have to become discouraged when things don't go the way that you thought they would go. There's a time in the Jesus ministry where John the Baptist, who is very integral into introducing Jesus in the world, and John's in prison at the hand of Herod. He's about ready to be beheaded. He's, he's literally weeks before his own death, and he sends some messengers, two messengers to Jesus, and they ask Jesus a question from John. They say, John wants to know, are you he that is to come, or should we look for another? Are you really the Messiah? Are you really the Son of God? Are you really the hope that we have, or should we be looking for somebody else. Jesus' response to him is simply this. It, just look around, John. The, the, the blind see, the lame walk, right? The deaf hear, the dead are raised. So I'm the one that you're looking for. And that comforted John. That allowed John to face with poison grace the incredibly difficult suffering experiences that he was in. This passage is going to deal with those kind of problems in your life. It's going to answer some of your deepest questions. What do we do with our doubts and our fears? How is it possible for us to remain hopeful about the future when there's so much negativity and hostility in the world around us? How, How can we, as followers of Jesus, not be overcome by our doubts, not be discouraged by our doubts? How can we not be held captive by our fears when it oftentimes looks like like things are literally coming apart in the world. I had an experience this week where on Wednesday I went to visit one of our faithful men. I've known him for 40 something years. He worked for me. We've got a very close personal relationship. Been a deacon in our church for years. His wife 
<clears throat> went home to be with the Lord on Friday. His daughter's here in the service this morning. And as I was visiting with him in the hospital on, on Wednesday, we were standing outside of his wife's room. The window to the ICU room was open and his wife went into cardiac arrest. And within what seemed like 45 seconds, there was 30 people in her hospital room trying to revive her. And, and literally, I was standing beside him. We're, we're, we're looking through the window, and, and I could feel his life unraveling as we stood there. And I, and, I, and I thought to myself immediately, and, and I, that's not the first time I've been through that. It, it's, it's tremendously difficult to try to help people. But I knew confidently, w- without any hesitation, that the only hope he had to keep from losing heart when his life is crumbling is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the mystery of the gospel is the key to dealing with all of life, including hardships. The gospel is the key to the mystery that unlocks the secret to life. Every one of you have a worldview. You you have something that that you believe about life and that that thing that you believe about life, whatever that thing is, is, is how you view everything that happens in your life. Every bad thing that happens, every good thing that happens, you, you view it through that prism. And Paul is writing to this church and he's, and he's pleading with them. He's, he's, he's arguing with them. He's, he's, he's begging them to think about this, that the gospel is the secret to the mystery of life. And you've got to connect yourselves, you've got to connect your life to the mystery of the gospel. Say, so what does that really look like? Well, let, let's work through this. This is really kind of one of these sermons that, the, the first part's a little bit teaching, and then we're gonna get to the last part, and the last part's a kind of a sermon within a sermon. First of all, let's talk about the revelation of the mystery. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain this mystery and, and define it for you as we go. We, we know it's the gospel. We know it's the fact that the gospel is all of grace. It's a gift that's given to us by God, and, and it, it, it's important. It's, it's, it's really the secret to life. You cannot know that mystery if you're following along in your outline unless it is divinely revealed. So the word for mystery, we have this, we, we, in vocabulary, we, we use words that mean multiple things. And, and so if you're, a, if you're a, a person that loves mysteries, whether it's a, a mystery movie or a mystery TV show or a mystery novel, you, you think of a mystery in terms of a riddle, right? And a riddle is something that you have to solve. It's a problem that you have to solve. It, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that demands an answer that you have to discover, that you have, to, you have to kind of work your way into it, and you've got to figure it out. That's not this kind of mystery. In fact, the word for mystery actually here is not a riddle that has to be uh, solved. It's something that God makes known, which means you would not have known it unless God revealed it to you. And by the way, let me just say this to you. If you're listening to me today and you think, I have no idea what you're talking about, hang on and you will get an idea about it and you'll have some clarity as we go. And if you do know, you know that the only reason you know it is God showed it to you. If, if, you, if he hadn't shown it to you, you would have missed it completely. It is a mystery that is divinely revealed. Not only is it divinely revealed, but it illuminates the big story of the Bible. In other words, it's not just this, this random kind of, um, you know, one of many worldviews, one of many truths that, that, that you can just kind of process. It is actually the mystery of the universe. It is the secret to all of life. It is the big story of the Bible. It is the grand narrative of Scripture, and we know that in the grand narrative of the scripture, the Bible is telling us a story about creation, how we got here, fall, what went terribly wrong in our world, and why is everything falling apart? Why is there so much evil and suffering and pain in our, in our world? Redemption, what Jesus did to rescue us from this fallen, broken world that we're living in, and then restoration, what is our 
future hope. And the gospel actually helps us to understand all of those uh, meta-narrative themes that are, are, are woven into the grand story of the Bible. It's what helps you to make sense of life. It really is what describes how God has been working in humanity and that your life and the events in your life are not simply some unconnected, isolated story, but it is deeply, deeply woven into the story of God's redemption and God's restoration through Jesus Christ. So the good news is there's a mystery that is revealed to you that answers the big secrets and questions of life. It leads us to this. What is the message of the mystery? Well, the message of the mystery is that God, by his grace, has brought you into a relationship with Jesus. And in that relationship, all the deepest needs of your life are being met. Now, I... Most of you know this. If you're new to our church, I, I'd love to get to know you and, and, and help you on a personal basis. Most of people's interaction with me is in, in teaching and preaching like this. And you that hear me all the time, you know these things about me. I grew up in church. I've been here for 41 years. I've been pastoring in this church for 31 years. And the thing I probably fight against the most in ministry, the most, the most difficult thing, and I say this, particularly for young people, is that in, in church context, in, in, a, in a historical church that's been around for a long time, generational church, we have a, we have a tendency to, to simplistically latch on to just elements of the gospel. So, in other words, if I talk about the gospel it's very easy for people that grow up in church says, yeah, the gospel is Jesus saved me from my sin so I don't have to go to hell when I die. I'm forgiven, I'm gonna go to heaven. And that's a really good thing, right? But, but let me tell you something. While that is core and essential to an understanding of the gospel, that is so much not the whole story of the gospel. The gospel is way richer than that. The gospel is way deeper than that, right? There, there's, there's so much more that you, that you have to understand. It's not just that your sins are forgiven. It's actually this, that the gospel is so much an expression of the brilliance of God's grace and the wisdom of God's heart that he puts it on display in a way in your life that causes your life to come together, and he does it through the fellowship of the mystery of the church where different disparate people are putting in, are put into, or put into one body by the amazing grace of God, and he, and he uses the salvation that you have in Jesus, and he uses the community of the gospel, the fellowship of the gospel with us collectively to make a radiant, brilliant display of his gospel, of the gospel of the grace of God in the world. Say, well, what does that mean? Well, in your outline, it's this. The gospel brings us salvation in Jesus. See, by God's grace, we do not earn salvation. Just look at this passage. We won't take every bit of this apart, but he he repeatedly uses this expression, gift. He uses the idea of grace. And what he's actually saying to us is we are simultaneously terrible sinners who have broken the law of God, and yet at the very same time, verse 8 and verse 9, at the very same time that we're terrible sinners that are breaking the law of God, and not just broke the law of God in the past, but we, we're breaking the law of God right now, and at the time that we're still breaking the law of God, we are justified, we are loved by God, we're holy, we're righteous, and we're accepted by God. That's amazing, right? Right? That, that you can be a terrible sinner, and at the very same time that you're a terrible sinner, you are absolutely loved beyond your wildest imagination by a God who doesn't overlook your sin as your fault, 
who paid for your sins so that he could redeem you and reclaim you. Now, let me, let me explain this to you. The reason the gospel's a mystery is that it's not obvious. If I said to you, you want to get access to God, you want to have the ability to come into, the, into God's presence, you want access into heaven, well, keep the Ten Commandments or obey the golden rule. And, and you would think to yourself naturally, not, not at all be surprised, think, well, yeah, that makes sense, right? If, if I do good things, then God is gonna accept me. If I don't break God's law, then I'm gonna be accepted by God. If I treat other people the way that they, they should be treated, the way that I want people to treat me, then God's gonna be happy with me and he's gonna let me into, into his presence. And yet, we know that doesn't happen, right? The mystery is this, counterintuitively, that you are righteous not because of how you perform. You are righteous because of of God's grace and the gift of that grace in your life that Jesus lived the life that you should have lived and he died the death that you should have died so that you could be redeemed. And the mystery of the gospel is an assault on work-based righteousness and it tears apart the idea of moralism as as a way to earn God's favor. See, God's plan was always to redeem us by his grace through the finished work of Jesus. And the gospel of grace is the only defense we have against the righteousness and the wrath of God. The storm of God's wrath is bearing down on every sinner. And the only defense you have against the storm of God's wrath is the justification of Jesus, that Jesus died in your place so that you could be spared. Say, what does that mean? Well, it means that through the grace of God, your life that is falling apart because of sin can now come together in Jesus. That because he has saved you individually, you don't have to experience the worst of who you are, you have a future hope. You have a future hope that the sin and the sorrow of this world cannot touch. So now here's what we know, that the mystery of the gospel is all of grace, it's a gift that God gives to you. It is bringing together all the hostile elements in the world. In other words, we're being united in Jesus. It's what's gonna help you to make sense of the suffering that you go through in life and it is a foretaste of future glory. You actually get a glimpse that the best is not what you're experiencing right now, but the best is yet to come in in the future when all things are united together in Jesus. And that that leads us to this thought. It's, It's here in your outline. The gospel brings us to unity in Jesus. See, the point that that Paul is aiming at is that we would be a new society or a new community in the world. That's the fellowship of the mystery. Nothing puts God's grace on display like a community of believers that are living out the reality of the gospel. I don't have time to unpack all this, but in the Old Testament, if you read the book of Deuteronomy, after the children of Israel have been given the law, they've actually been given it a second time. Moses broke the tablets the first time, and God's instruction then is, hey, look, take these commandments, these these 10 commandments and all these other associated commandments that are expanded with it, that some are moral, some are ceremonial. They're teaching you how to live and teaching you how to worship. And as you keep my commandments, the nation states around you are gonna get a glimpse of, of how different you are because of, you, of me in your life. And they're gonna look at you and they're gonna see my brilliance. They're gonna see my glory. They're, 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 they're going to start to admire me. They're, they're, they're going to see in me something that makes you so distinct. When you come to Ephesians chapter 3, what Paul is saying is now you're really God's intended purpose. You have been the plan of God all along that God would take Jew and Gentile. He would take the disparate things, the, 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 the things that don't naturally come together, the things that, that mix like oil and water, and he's bringing you together so that you can live out the gospel in a way that puts the brilliance of God's glory on display that becomes a dazzling beauty that people look like and say, there's nothing like this in the entire world. Nothing like it. 
I mean, I could give you, I, literally, I could give you hundreds of anecdotal stories about it. How people's deep, look, you'll see this at the end, and I'm not trying to tip, tip anything off, but, but um, some of our kids went to camp this week. Some of the kids that couldn't afford to go to camp were, went to camp because people in the church were generous and they gave to it. And kids that couldn't afford to go to camp went to camp, heard the gospel, and became Christians because people in the church pooled their resources together to do things for people that they could not do for themselves. That's, that's the beauty of the gospel, right? It's being put on full display. You see, God's ultimate purpose is for everything to be healed in Jesus, for everything to come together in Jesus. Do you, do you understand everything in life is falling apart? Relationships fall apart. Families fall apart. Society falls apart. Businesses fall apart. Your hopes and dreams fall apart. You probably don't know this yet because you're so young and vibrant. Wait till you get to be my age. Your body falls apart. Amen. My wife and I walked in this morning and this shows you how old I am and how young she is. I walked over to the ramp with a, with a, a railing to step up onto the, the sidewalk. She just steps up on the sidewalk. I'm like, who do you think you are? Some 25 year old? I'm like, <clears throat> when you have trifocals and you can't, your depth perception is not good, I mean, I'd be apt to hit the curb and fall on my face, right? Your body falls apart, everything falls apart. In Jesus, all the mutually hostile elements in creation will be united, healed and brought together. F.F. Bruce, commentator, said, God's pilot plan for the reconciled universe of the future is the church. Do you know what a pilot to a series is? I'm, no, I'm not a big, I, I went to cancel Netflix the other day and then I found out everybody in my family uses our Netflix subscription. <laughs> I think everybody in our church uses it too, but I mean, I, Apparently they keep charging, my Netflix, they, once they get you, you're in forever. A pilot is a standalone episode that is a prelude to a future series. It's a preview that's gonna point to something greater that's still to come. Do you know what the church is? It's a pilot, it's a preview, it's a prelude to a reconciled creation for all eternity. The church is actually saying to, to, the, the church is saying to the world, and, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's whispering to us is that, that, hey, things are going to get better. Things are going to be healed. Things in your life aren't going to keep falling apart. Jesus is the answer to everything. He is the hope. He is the healing of all that is wrong with our world. That's the message of the mystery. And it brings us to this, the power of the mystery. Now, I told you earlier that this is really a sermon within a sermon. And <clears throat> what, what I just did is, is tried to summarize and unpack for you what verses 10 through 11 are really saying. So let me go back and, and just say, here's Paul, and he says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus because of you. My faith has put me where I am in Christ. I'm a prisoner, but in Jesus, I am more than a prisoner in Jesus, we have boldness and access with confidence, the freedom to approach into the presence of God by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire, I am pleading for you, don't faint at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Now, let me tell you something. There is nothing so practical as the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's nothing that'll heal all the hurt in your life like the gospel. Doesn't mean you won't have pain, you will have pain. But it gives you the ultimate answers, not, 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 not surface level things, not, not just feel goods, not placebos, not, not things that are, are just trying to give you a little bit of, a, of, a, of an uplift, but really deep cosmic truths that you can build your entire life on. Here's what Paul's saying. 
look at me. Look at my suffering. Look at the hardships I'm facing. Look at the difficulties I'm going through. And let me tell you how the gospel, the mystery of the gospel, answers the problems of life. Number one, because of the gospel, your suffering has a purpose. Do you get that? What does he say? I'm a prisoner of Christ on your behalf. In other words, everything that happens in our life, including our suffering, is to reveal the manifold wisdom of God. Elizabeth Elliot, I'll tell you a little bit more about her in a moment. She wrote a remarkable little book. It's, it's the summation of, of a series of talks that she did in, on, on the subject of suffering. And if anybody ever suffered, Elizabeth Elliot surely was acquainted with suffering. She said, she wrote, the title of her book is Suffering is Never for nothing. Suffering is never for nothing. She defines suffering this way. Suffering is wanting something you do not have or having something that you do not want. It's tremendously insightful. And she makes a case in that book that even when you think what you're going through is unfair, that it's cruel, that it's inexplicable. There's always a purpose for it. If you look at verse number 10, he actually says here this, this language to the intent. It's, it's literally, for the purpose that now unto the principalities and heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. What, what, what he's really saying is this. Even if you can't find an earthly reason for your suffering, even if you can't make sense out of your suffering in in. In, through, your, through your own intellect and through your own reasoning, there's a purpose that is so eternal that it's being unfolded and guaranteed to be played out. Joni Erickson Tata, was, was para, she became paraplegic at 18 years old. And she was an athlete, she's a very active person, and she's been uh, paralyzed since 18, all of her adult life. She had begun to process through why she would go through it. She's a remarkable Christian. And she, she started to develop these hypotheses. One hypothesis was we suffer because in our suffering we, we, we become better. We know God more intimately through our suffering. And then her second hypothesis was that through suffering we're able to, to be a testimony to other people. And then Joni Erickson, while she was going through rehab and recovery, she was in a, in a place where there was others that were in similar conditions, and there was a girl that was brought in, and this girl had, she was 17 years old, just completely active, life, just full of life, just very active and, and happy about life, and, and literally she slipped on a stair, went home, two hours later, she was paralyzed from the waist down. Two weeks later, she was paralyzed from the neck down. And two weeks after that, she, had, she lost her eyesight. She was completely blind. The only muscle function that she had left at all was she could, she could barely communicate, articulate words. And <clears throat> she's in this hospital and for months and months and months and months. She lived about three years. Only her mother, no, not, not one other single person, only her mother came to see her. No, not a friend, not any other family member, just, just her mother. And her mother came every night and read a little bit of the Bible to her and prayed with her. And, and it threw Joni Erickson for a loop because she's like, there's no, there's, she's, She's not even able to testify through what happened to her at all. And then somebody, <clears throat> several years later, showed Joni Erickson taught of this, this passage of Scripture and explained it this way. The purpose of what you're going through is that the, the principalities and powers, the angels in heaven, are able to see through what you go through, the manifold, which is literally the brilliant display 
of God's grace in your life. You may think you're a nobody. You may think that you're insignificant. You may think nobody cares at all about what you're going through. And everything that you're going through is on full display for the angels in heaven. And the Bible says in 1 Peter, and they're looking down into the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're unceasingly studying the riches of God's grace, what's happening in your life. Suffering is never for nothing. It always has a purpose. Suffering, because of the gospel, your suffering cannot harm you. It cannot harm you. Now, I know some of you think, but you don't know the pain I'm going through. Oh, I know you go through pain, and I know through, that you go through loss, and I know that you go through difficulty, and I know that you have questions. That, that's the whole point, right? But Paul is actually saying some really helpful things here. He, he says, I don't see myself as a victim. I'm not wrongly imprisoned. I am not feeling sorry for myself. He sees himself as being where God wants him to be as a prisoner of Christ for the purpose that God has for him on behalf of the Gentile. And you say, how is it that Paul could do that? It's because of his treasure. Here's what Paul treasured. I want you to really listen to me for a minute. He treasured the freedom that he had, verse 12, to come boldly into the presence of God to have standing with God. Having standing with God meant infinitely more to him than anything he might or might not have, right? Having something that you do not want or wanting something that you do not have. He, he, having, having freedom with God, having standing before God meant infinitely more to him than, than his circumstances outwardly of being in prison. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Do do you know why some of you are having a hard time getting through what you're going through in life? Because you treasure the thing that you either have that you do not want, or you treasure the thing that you want that you do not have. That's why you're suffering. Now, I'm not saying those things aren't important, but, but listen to me, listen carefully to me. If you want those things more than you want Jesus, you can never be happy. You'll never be happy. But when you learn to want him and you treasure him more than you treasure all those things, nothing can take away your happiness. I mentioned Elizabeth Elliot. She's she's a remarkable person. I read a couple of her books this week, so she's on my mind, but it's a fitting illustration. She, born 1926, went to Wheaton College, Married Jim Elliott, Jim Elliott with four of his friends. Each of them were married. They went to Ecuador and they engaged an unreached tribe, the Aka Indians, and <clears throat> had a Jim and Elizabeth Elliott had a little girl. She's a couple years old. 1956, Jim Elliott was, was martyred. He was killed along with five other or four other missionary men. They were killed in a river by the Aka Indians devastating. I mean, it just, can you imagine all, all Elizabeth Elliot had ever dreamed about was being married, having children, and being a missionary. That's what she, that, that was her dream. That's what, she, that's what she believed she was born for. Within two years, she's living in the village among the people, among the very men who had killed her husband and those four other missionaries with her daughter. And she's sharing the gospel. She, she remained single for 10 years, and then she remarried. She remarried a man that was a little older than her. He was a professor of theology at Gordon-Conwell Seminary in Boston. She was married for three and a half years, and her her second husband got cancer and died. So here's here's a woman. I mean, she's given her whole life to God, right? She's she, she's the, the quintessential, I'm gonna serve God with my life. And she's been married twice and both her husbands have died. You don't wanna be the third guy that marries her. <laughs> that, that's enough, that has nothing to do with this illustration. <clears throat> At the funeral of her second husband, 
the seminary students at Gordon Conwell were were kind of mesmerized by what is she going to say? How is she going to how is she going to explain all this? How is she going to testify to this? What what's, what is going to be her her way of articulating this? And 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 they're thinking. Surely she's got to fall apart. Surely this has got to be deeply painful and deeply emotional for her. And, and when Elizabeth Elliot gets up at that memorial service, she, she grieved with such a steely resolve and a conviction that all suffering only reveals the infinite wisdom, the matchless grace, and the unrivaled power of God that it made such an impression on those students. So why, why was she able to do that? Why was she not devastated? Why, didn't, why, why, why did her life just not come apart at the seams when it seems like it should have? Because her treasure wasn't in being married. Her treasure wasn't in her husband. Her treasure wasn't in her, her family. Her treasure wasn't in her hopes and dreams for what she thought her life should look like. Her treasure wasn't in that her life was gonna be better or as good as somebody else's life. Her treasure was in Jesus Christ. And when your treasure's in him, there's nothing, there's no suffering in the world that can harm you. And finally, because of the gospel, your suffering will be for glory. Look what he says here in verse 13. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Let me tell you something real quick. Here's the gospel. Jesus triumphed through weakness. In other words, right, what what is it that happened with Jesus? He endured the cross and despised the shame. He suffered. You say, why did he do that? For future glory, so that now he could be set at the right hand of the throne of God on high. This is a remarkable insight. In fact, it, it, it's, an, it's, a, it's an amazing, deeply amazing spiritual principle. Jesus was the only person that had the freedom and confidence to approach God because he lived a perfect life. Jesus is the only one that could go directly into the throne of God. He's the only one that had access to him. And, and he's the only one that kept all the commandments. He's the only one that lived the golden rule. And he could go in to God's presence and he deserved to be there. He was justified in being there. You know what Jesus did? He said, cast me out so that they can be brought in. Did you see what he did? He said, let me suffer so that the glory that that is rightfully mine can be given to all these people, these sinful people, these law-breaking people, these least of all the saints' people. Cast me out so that they can come in. And at the end of his life, instead of going right into the presence of God, when he died, he was nailed to the cross. He was bound in grave clothes. He was buried in a tomb. And he did that so that you and I could get access. He took away the one and only kind of suffering that can really ultimately destroy you. He took all the suffering so that your life, including all the terrible things that you go through, could be turned into dazzling beauty. I've quoted this for you many times. Dostoevsky and the brothers Karamazov said, I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for. That all the humiliating absurdities of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage that in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, in other words, when everything comes together in Jesus, when we, we meet together at the throne of God, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts 
for the comforting of all the resentments. In other words, every little hurt and heartache you have in your life today, it will be comforted for the atoning of all the crimes of humanity. They'll all be paid for, for all the blood that they've shed and that it will make it not only possible for to forgive, but to justify what has happened, which literally is this. It's, it's what... It's what Tolkien said when he, when he, when he in, in, in that famous place where, where Sam Ganji um, says, are all sad things going to become untrue? Yes. Every hurt, every heartache, all suffering is going to be reversed and it's going to be, it's going to be reconciled and Jesus is going to be made right. And you're going to experience completely in eternity everything that God intended for you at creation. You see that? The mystery of the gospel begins, becomes a pathway for you to deal with the problems and the hardships in your life. The gospel answers the biggest questions in life. It, it, it not only deals with your doubt, but the gospel points you to future hope. And the gospel instills in your heart a confidence in the brilliance of God's glory and God's grace that says everything in your life is going to become beautiful because of what Jesus did for you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Stand with me. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Here's what that means. If you don't understand that today, would you just pray this, God, make the mystery known to me. Show me the truth of the gospel of Jesus. If you're ready to receive that gospel, you've never become a Christian, you've never been born again by the Spirit of God today, would you just bow your heads and ask Jesus to come into your life? Would you just cast yourself on him, not because of what you do and how you perform, but the counterintuitiveness that God has given you, the gift of God's grace through what Jesus did. And you can be a law-breaking sinner and because of Jesus be justified at the same time. And would you say, God, through the church, through the manifold brilliance and wisdom of God, the gospel can be put on display in my life. These altars are open. God speaks to your heart. Bring your problems, your burdens, your troubles to Jesus. Father, speak to us today. Thank you that in Jesus, everything makes sense. Thank you in Jesus that we have a treasure that doesn't allow us to have to just trust in good things or it doesn't make us have to turn good things into God things. That through the gospel, we have the ultimate need of our lives met. May you help us to apply that in very real ways in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.